Hey guys, I'm International Master Kosti Kavutsky, uh, back in tuning my series for Lee Chess uh, on the classics, covering some of the world's greatest chess players. And uh, today's video is about a couple of uh, English players. Um, first, uh, John Cochrane, who's actually originally from, from Scotland, and uh, Howard Staunton from England. And uh, these guys were really brilliant players. Uh, but before we get into that, I actually want to issue a correction. I uh, got something wrong in last week's video about Alexander McDonnell. Um, in the King's Gambit specifically, I very wrongly stated that he was the one who first came up with this peace sacrifice um, where white uh, allows black to take the knight on f3, just recaptures with the queen, and then gets this um, huge initiative. So this actually goes back to way before the 19th century um, when McDonald was playing, actually the 16th century, and this sacrifice should be credited to uh, Polerio, who is an Italian player. Um, and the original idea was to play castles. I believe this is now known as the Museo Gambit. Um, and uh, yeah, the idea is essentially the same. White decides to sacrifice the knight and just gets this huge attack, huge lead in development. Um, so McDonald did contribute something to this theory. He contributed the move knight to c3. Uh, he was the first player to make this work and this variation is named after him, but he is not by no means the inventor of this peace sacrifice. This predates him about 200 years. Uh, so I appreciate um, the, the person in the comments uh, in the previous video who uh, corrected me uh, on the video and uh, yeah, now you guys know the real truth. Um, so going to uh, today's players, um, the first one I'd like to talk about is uh, John Cochrane, who was around a little bit earlier than Staunton, and um, I believe he is best known for inventing the Cochrane Gambit uh, in the Petrov defense. And uh, the first time he used this idea, which happens after knight f3, knight f6, knight takes e5, and d6, um, nowadays, the main line is, of course, just to go back with knight f3. And then after black takes this pawn, uh, wins their pawn back, white has a number of options here, d4, knight c3, and so on. Um, but Cochrane was, of course, the first player to invent this sacrifice with knight takes f7. Uh, and he played this in a match where he played tons and tons of games against a, a player from Bangladesh, uh, Mohi Shunder Banerjee. And... Um, it was really fascinating going through some of their games because they basically played this line in dozens and dozens of chess games. Uh, Cochrane won most of them, <laughs> to, to be fair. Not all of them, but he won a great majority. Although I would definitely wouldn't say it was because of the, the strength of this opening, but rather because of the, uh, the serious practical problems that, that Black was, was posed. Um, objectively, actually, Black was doing quite fine in a lot of these games. In fact, in this main game uh, today, Black... Uh, had all of the chances to to defend successfully, um, but Cochrane was a very strong attacker. And looking through his games, I definitely felt like he had no problem just building the attack uh, and playing for the initiative, but not rushing to checkmate his opponent whatsoever. And that's kind of what this gambit is about, because White does give up a knight for two pawns. Um, but in compensation with the two pawns, uh, also brings the king out in the open, black loses their castling rights, and white doesn't get such a huge lead in development, but he does get some very strong central pawns, and a lot of Cochrane's games uh, featured these ideas of just grabbing a ton of uh, space with the pawns, pushing d4, f4, eventually pushing e5, and just trying to really squeeze and strangle the opponent. Um, so in this game, uh, black played king to e8. Um, the best moves considered by theory here are bishop e6, which allows white to bring black's king even further out into the open, but on the other hand, black has traded off white's uh, best bishop. Um, or the perhaps even stronger move d5, where black gives up another pawn, but at the same time is able to kind of uh, stunt white's initiative uh, for quite some time. So theoretically speaking, nowadays the Cochrane Gambit isn't considered uh, to be uh, so great for white. There is a well-known game where Topalov used it very successfully uh, against Kramnik in a very high-level encounter, um, but other than that, it, it's not really given a whole lot of respect at the Grandmaster level. But okay, this was of course a different time, and back then, having this kind of natural initiative uh, was considered very, very serious. Uh, so in this game, Black played c5, um, but like I mentioned, these guys play like 50 or 60 games between uh, each other, um, always exploring this exact same variation. So if you want to check out a couple more games, do make sure to check out uh, the study uh, that heads to uh, Leech S, uh, provided in the description below. 
and uh, I've annotated this game and included a couple of other examples uh, within the notes that you can play through just to get a feeling for how these guys uh, had some of their chess games play out. Um, so in this game, black plays c5, uh, white goes h3, and I just want to stop here because this is not a move that you would really expect uh, in this era of chess, um, because this was the romantic era, people were sacrificing pieces, playing for the initiative. Not a lot of players were willing to make this kind of slow move um, like h3, where white simply improves the position, takes control over the g4 square, doesn't allow bishop g4, doesn't allow knight g4, um, but of course we would expect white to play with a little bit more initiative. Um, but I think this was kind of Cochrane's signature. He just didn't mind being uh, material down, he considered it a long-term sacrifice, and I think it's very, very instructive to see how he conducted some of these games. So, queen c7, uh, f4, knight c6, knight c3, white is just developing calmly, um, a6, a4, again, just taking his time like to make a prophylactic move, stopping b5, uh, black play queen to e7. Uh, I definitely don't think uh, Banerjee was uh, the greatest defender, but you know, <laughs> he was doing the best he could. Um, now white goes knight d5, queen d8, and uh, d4. Sacrificing more material, just trying to open open lines in the center. Um, this move is not necessarily good according to the engine, but it's certainly in the spirit of the position. And well, White's plan here is to ju just try to open lines and create uh, attacking ideas against Black's king. So C takes D4. Now White blasts more things open with E5. Uh, knight takes D5. Bishop takes D5. D E. And uh, bishop takes c6. I mean, this is actually a really interesting decision. Um, objectively, th the computer hates it, but I think it does lead to uh, a powerful position where black simply wasn't able to uh, to figure it out. Um, so white takes on c6 and then goes queen h5 check, and the point of taking on c6 first was to be able to uh, give this check and also be able to take on e5 um, so that black wouldn't be able to play g6 here, uh, for example. Um, so king d7. Uh, now white takes fe, opening up the rook and trying to get rook f7 check. Uh, king c7, black goes for the run, rook f7, king b8, and now e6. So threatening a very, very nasty check with bishop f4. Uh, black goes bishop d6, uh, white goes bishop g5, queen b6, and a5. Um, now black goes queen c5, which uh, is actually a blunder and potentially losing the game, uh, but surprisingly Cochrane doesn't find it. Um, he goes b4, which is a very interesting move, but uh, bishop f4 would have just won immediately on the spot. Uh, black's queen is under attack, as well as the bishop, So, but if queen takes h5, bishop takes d6, is a very nice mate on the board. Um, so he surprisingly misses that idea, he plays b4. His point is that if black takes on b4, I believe he wanted the move rook f f1, bringing this rook back and threatening uh, rook fb1 check, where black's king is going to be in huge danger. Maybe rook ab1, just so the second rook can come back to f7 if needed. Um, but instead black plays queen e5, uh, which is a blunder, and uh, now white finds bishop f4 and wins the game based on the exact same reason uh, as before. Um, had black played queen d5 here, he would have had a winning position. Whether he would have won the game is, of course, impossible to say, um, but objectively white's attack wouldn't have been enough, which was a pretty common thing back in those days. The attacks were often objectively unsound, but the defense wasn't there, so they ended up working quite a bit. Um, this was one of those cases where black goes queen e5, bishop f4, black goes queen takes e6, uh, and now queen c5, a nice idea here, making use of a lot of motifs uh, with the bishop pin and the rook covering this way, so if black takes the bishop on f4, gonna run into queen b6 check uh, and mate. Um, black tried queen takes f7, the rook was also hanging, but now uh, black is just getting mated uh, on the dark squares. And uh, the final position was quite aesthetic with a nice checkmate uh, by the bishop, and, and that was it. So while Cochrane was considered one of the world's best players uh, in the early 19th century, um, pretty soon after him, another player, Howard Staunton, came onto the scene uh, and eventually surpassed Cochrane uh, as uh, Brit uh, Britain's best player uh, and eventually was considered one of the very, very best players in the world. Um, I, the first game I want to show from Staunton was actually played uh, in a correspondence style against an entire city, uh, city of Bristol. And uh, this game, I think, really exemplifies uh, Staunton's uh, style, um, which 
was definitely an attacking style, but much more focused on uh, positional themes. And I, I really feel like Staunton was a very natural predecessor uh, to the first official world champion, Willem Steinitz, uh, who was known for his uh, you know, great understanding of positional chess and always uh, seeking uh, positional ideas to justify uh, attacking combinations. Um, in this game, Staunton uh, starts with f4, plays uh, the bird's opening, um, knight f3, c5, e3, knight c6, and bishop b5. And this is basically, looks very similar to a uh, type of Nimzo Indian uh, slash Dutch hybrid. Uh, if you flip the colors, this is a pretty typical setup for black where they go f5 and they try to play bishop b4 and put pressure on this knight on c6. Um, of course, this game was played in 1841, so, you know, five, six decades before Nimzovich was, was even around. Um, here black played a6, this we can definitely consider uh, not a great move because um, nowadays of course we know that white is often intending to take the knight anyway, so it doesn't really make sense to spend the tempo on a6 uh, trying to get white to do something they already wanted to do. Instead any other move, e6, knight f6 is basically better. Um, but okay, black goes a6, white happily trades on c6, castles, e6, uh, and now c4. And uh, yeah, I really felt like this game had uh, a very modern touch to it because this is exactly the way a modern uh, GM would play this type of position. Uh, they would try to fix uh, Black's weak C pawns. Um, they're offering their own C pawn so that if Black takes it, when White is able to win this pawn back, um, of course, Black's remaining pawns are going to be extremely weak. Um, so Black ignores it, goes knight h6, queen e2, bishop d6, knight c3. And white basically develops in uh, a very natural style uh, like we would see in any Nimzo Indian or reverse Nimzo uh, today. Uh, so f6, black tries to blunt the bishop, white goes d3. Again, this is very appropriate for the position. White is simply uh, securing the c4 square as much as possible and always inviting black to capture so that white can recapture, most likely with the b pawn, and then leave black with this incredibly weak uh, c5 pawn. Um, so moving on to the game black castles white goes e4 here and here black makes a pretty serious mistake with d takes e4 uh, the reason being again black is kind of isolating their own pawns uh, on the c file here and just giving white a strategically uh, fantastic position um, after d e4 black went e5 and white very correctly plays f5 um, shutting down black's light square bishop which would otherwise be a very good piece but is now just fully restricted and um, what I found from Staunton's play was that he was he was really keen on just building the attack. Um, he was a, an aggressive player, basically like everyone was around this time, but he was really attuned to strategic moments and yeah, just really, really good at taking space and slowly building his position. Um, so here he goes, knight h4, bishop d7, rook f3, he's clearly just lifting everything towards the king side. Uh, rook d8 was played and uh, white just continues developing the attack, knight g5, rook g3, h6, queen g4, uh, rook d7, knight f3, king f8, knight takes g5, h takes g5, uh, and now h4. So white is just trying to break through here, um, black holds on as best he can, bishop f7, hg, king e8, g6, bishop g8, and uh, there was, the way white breaks through here is just really, really interesting. He goes rook h3, uh, king d8, and he doesn't even mess around with rook h8 because he doesn't really need this yet. Black is anyway just going to play king c7 next. Um, but he said he goes queen e2. So Staunton very correctly adjusts his idea. He stops playing on the king side because it seems like black is, is basically just holding the king side for the moment. And instead he goes queen e2, and after king c7, knight a4, he kind of shows his in intentions. Is he just wants to pile up on this c5 pawn. He realizes he doesn't have to break through on the king side anymore. Now he can just play queen f2 next move, and the black is unable to defend this uh, critical weakness. Uh, and basically after this happened, the game was more or less over. Um, white doesn't even take the pawn immediately, first goes g4, and then after queen c7, bishop takes c5, uh, the game was essentially over. White had won a pawn and is left with just a strategically crushing position. Of course, black's bishop on g8 is just uh, totally busted here. 
Um, so another game I really like, probably one of Staunton's um, better known games, uh, is a game he actually played against Cochrane in 1842. Uh, so they had a match in London in 1842 where it was basically just kind of uh, shown that Staunton was a, a superior player because he won the match. Um, interestingly enough, after this match, uh, Cochrane actually went on to help Staunton uh, with uh, another match and actually became his second. And uh, apparently this was one of the first times in chess history that a player actually had a second and like traveled with them uh, to, uh, to a future match. Um, so in this game, uh, Staunton uses the Evans Gambit, which we actually saw in the, the previous video. Um, Cochrane accepts c3, bishop a5, castles bishop b6, bishop a3, d6, and d4. So, so far white is playing this uh, very, very naturally. He sacrificed the pawn, he has some nice lead in development, and uh, with d4 he's basically threatening to potentially take on e5, um, after which uh, the center is going to open up and white might want to play queen b3, target the f7 pawn, uh, and uh, of course is playing for the initiative. Um, here black goes e takes d4, which I think is uh, not a great move. Um, a better move is queen f6, which was eventually shown by uh, the world champion Lasker uh, many years later. Um, but black goes e takes d4, c takes d4, knight f6. Um, I think this was another kind of small mistake. Bishop g4 was really necessary. Because um, after knight f6, e5 takes and queen b3, just a fantastic move. Um, basically, black's king is kind of a sitting duck in the center. The bishop on a3 is cutting uh, the king from being able to castle, and of course the queen and bishop are lining up to uh, just attack f7 with some deadly force. Um, so here black is forced to go queen to d7, uh, white takes back on e5, knight a5 is played, and uh, of course e takes f6, the queen sacrifice, uh, really just brilliant stuff. The point is after knight takes b3, rook e1 check, king d8, bishop e7, king e8, and f takes g7, uh, the real point of the combination. Um, white is just taking down too much material here. Black's king is still in huge, huge trouble, and uh, the game did not last much longer. Black played rook g8, bishop f6 check, and this pawn is of course taking away one of the king's uh, key escape squares, so black is forced to simply give back the queen, and after uh, bishop takes e6, bishop e6, and a takes b3, uh, black simply resigned here because he's down a piece, he has zero compensation for it, his king still can't castle, all his pieces are essentially stuck, and yeah, there's just absolutely nothing for, for black to play for. Um, so this wasn't a particularly... Uh, difficult game, I imagine, for White, um, but it was pretty instructive with the way he kind of conducted the attack and just broke through uh, very, very quickly. And um, the final example I just want to show to highlight um, the play of Staunton, um, this comes from his somewhat unofficial uh, World Championship match. And it was by winning this match against uh, the French player uh, Pierre Saint Amant uh, that really cemented uh, Staunton's status as not just one of the world's best players, but possibly the world's best player uh, at this period in time. Um, I just wanted to show one highlight here because I feel like the idea that Staunton used to win this game um, was about a hundred years ahead of his time. And um, in this position, playing black, he plays the move uh, rook to c4. So kind of plugging the rook into white's position. Um, the rook is, of course, attacking the b4 pawn, putting pressure on d4, and eventually setting up a potential doubling uh, along the c-file, of course, provided that uh, white's bishop is not still on f5. Um, so white goes knight a2 here. Black goes knight f6. Of course, black would be really, really happy if rook takes c4. He can go d takes c4 and open up his uh, his fantastic bishop. But instead, white goes bishop d3, attacking the rook. And here's kind of the idea that I wanted to show that uh, Staunton ends up using. And uh, as you might realize, or might have guessed, he plays the move queen to c6. Of course, he just leaves that rook on c4. And to me, this felt like a very uh, Petrosian-like sacrifice. This type of exchange sacrifice uh, is usually associated with the world champion uh, Tigran Petrosian, who was around in the 1950s, 1960s. And um, here, Staunton is playing this type of sacrifice back in uh, 1843, so way, way, way ahead of his time. Um, of course, we all knew that Petrosian didn't invent the exchange sacrifice, but still, it's nice to see um, some really early examples of uh, this type of positional sacrifice. Because if 
white takes on c4 immediately, of course, we can consider this just a combination um, since the queen is hanging and mate is hanging on g2. So here it's not like um, white is really uh, able to take the rook, but Staunton's in intention was, of course, to sacrifice because after the moves queen v2, he goes queen d7, um, king g1. Now black's rook on c4 really is hanging and white is starting to take it, and he goes ahead and plays knight h5. He just says, go ahead. Um, now at this point, I think white really should have taken this uh, this rook. I think he was a little bit afraid of the sacrifice, but objectively, Stockfish says, you know, black has compensation, but is not winning, and after knight c3, white could keep fighting. Clearly, black has some ideas here with the two bishops pointing against white's king, um, but uh, it's hard to argue with the engine, and <laughs> I would say that black has um, some really good uh, chances here and some very strong practical compensation. Um, instead, white goes queen d2, he just continues playing around the rook, and uh, black kind of shows the, the real point behind his last move, knight h5, with the move f5, launching the f-pawn forward, threatening f4 now, and uh, trapping white's bishop. Um, so here white goes f4, uh, he wants to stop this plan and prevent black from gaining space, but I think this is a move that white ends up regretting. Um, because after knight to g3, black is going to be able to potentially use this e4 square, which of course white just gave away. So I think back here f3 would have been uh, a lot safer. Um, still stopping the threat of f4, but also keeping control over the e4 square. So white goes f4, knight g3, finally takes on c4 here, d takes c4, queen b2, and uh, rook f6. So Staunton just plays this attack uh, in a very straightforward way. He's down the exchange, but to him it doesn't really matter because this light squared bishop is worth at least as much as a rook to him, if not more. Um, white goes knight c3, knight to e4. It's interesting that he's completely willing to exchange knights and simply leave himself with an absolutely dominant bishop on uh, e4 here. Um, instead, white goes rook e2, rook g6, rook d1. This is kind of a losing mistake after knight takes c3, queen takes c3, and bishop f3. Nice tactic. Uh, black wins back the material, and uh, after winning back the exchange in queen e7, um, black just has a strategically winning position. White has this weakness, white is still super weak on the light squares, uh, the f4 pawn is weak, and uh, the game did not really last much longer. Black just had way too much pressure here and uh, eventually was able to uh, convert after a couple of moves here. Queen h1, h4, g5, black is just trying to uh, break through here. Queen to e1, queen h2 check, queen h3 check, queen g4, and after bishop takes f4, it was all over. Uh, now rook on e2 is hanging, and uh, of course everything is pinned, and uh, white ended up down the exchange and uh, just completely losing endgame. Uh, so this was a really brilliant victory by Staunton. I was truly impressed by this game, this exchange sacrifice that was uh, just light years ahead of his time. And uh, yeah, I, I believe that Staunton was definitely one of the best, if not the best player in the 1840s and 1850s. And uh, of course, around this time, uh, another player came along that I'm of course going to cover in a future video, uh, Paul Morphy. Uh, now, apparently Staunton and Morphy had a bit of uh, controversy between them. Um, they kind of knew that they were the best players in the world and they were trying to arrange some kind of match. Uh, apparently chess historians still haven't quite gotten the story right and no one knows who exactly was the one who chickened out or uh, didn't make uh, ends meet. But the match unfortunately never ended up uh, happening. Uh, eventually Staunton grew old, you know, his health was deteriorating and he could no longer play chess at the highest level. And uh, Morphe uh, was much younger, he had his own issues of course, and yeah, they never got to play. Um, well, with that, I'm going to be wrapping up this video here. Uh, if you enjoyed the video, uh, please do leave a like on it and let us know in the comments. It really does help grow the channel. And uh, I'll see you guys next time. Take care.